This is Bible Academy. I'm pastor and teacher Curtis Omo. We are in the Gospel of John, chapter 16. Now, before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we're allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for this opportunity and everything you've provided for us to study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus has been instructing his disciples about the most difficult times ahead for them once Jesus has departed. Let's go back and look at our translation that we have so far in chapter 16. Jesus continues to speak. <clears throat> These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcast from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you will think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father, or me. We didn't get to the application portion of these scriptures, so we're going to start today with that. Some of you have already began to, probably already began to apply some of these principles, especially if you went through uh, Romans with me. When people reject the gospel, reject those who give the gospel, in other words, reject Christians, we see they turn to persecution in one form or another. Now, I'm not going to go to Romans and teach that right now, but we're going to stay with what Jesus has taught and sort of sum up some of the things that I want us to see about these people who are hardened toward the gospel. In this case, it's all Jewish people. Of course, this applies <clears throat> universally to anybody who is caught up into some religion, who do not really know God. Here's some points. Point one. Now this again is about, particularly this is about Jewish religious people, including their leaders, who really do not know God. It's an amazing thing how much time and effort, resources, finances are put into people's religion thinking in some way it getting, it's getting them closer to God or better with God or helping their spiritual life when in fact they're not even gaining anything with God. Point one about these Jewish religious people, Jesus said they do not know God. 7, 9, and 16, 3. 2. Jesus said they did not know God's will. 7, 17. 3. They accused Jesus Christ of being demon-possessed. 7, 20. 4. They said his testimony was not acceptable. 8, 13. 5. Jesus said they did not follow Abraham as a father, meaning spiritual father. 8, 38 through 39. 6. They could not accept Jesus' words. 8.43. 7. Jesus said God is not their father. 8.42. 8. Their father is the devil. 8.44. And 9. They did not belong to God. 8.47. Time and time again, Jesus told these Jewish religious people that they don't know God. He's not their father, which tells us that they were completely off base. However, Jesus, as he stood there before them, he was and is the Yahweh of the Old Testament. He is the I Am. These people never partake of him as the bread, the drink, the food, or accept him as the I Am. They rejected the light. 
the Word, that is, capital W, Him as Word, Jesus as the Word, they rejected His miracles and His words. The plain, clear fact of the matter is that since they did not accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah, they do not know the God of the Messiah. In fact, these religious Jews don't know the God of the Old Testament. They think they do, but who could be more clearer or more trusted in his own testimony and what Jesus said about these people. Now, if you were to say these things about the Jewish people today, out in many circles, people would say you're anti-Semitic or anti-Jew. But what did Jesus say about them? They don't know his Father. They don't know him. They don't know God. They don't belong to God. And folks, this applies to any group who's caught up in a religion that, ex that rejects Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, keep in mind also, they have, may have read the Word of God, read the Old Testament, quote it to you, but they really don't know it. They don't understand it. It doesn't pen penetrate into the hearts and minds, into their spirit, so that they truly have a connection with God. So they don't believe it as they should and do not properly apply it. So they miss all three steps necessary to grow spiritually. They don't understand the word. They don't learn it. They don't believe it. And they don't apply it. Now if I was to give you this list that I just counted off that Jesus said about them. And Jesus said all these things about the Jews. If I was to apply that to any other group besides the Jews, what would you say about them? How would you evaluate them? Well, to say the least, we would say they're unbelievers. They're pagans. So keep in mind, and as hard as this is for us to understand, the Jewish people in the time of Jesus who kept rejecting him did not know God. He said they didn't belong to God. And he wasn't their father. But they were convinced that all those things were true of them. That they were connected to God, belonged to God, that he's their father. And you can see how they would take such great offense at the things that Jesus said to them about them. To tell a Jew that God is not his father. That they don't really know God. That Abraham is not their father. Father, Jesus meant spiritual father. They don't know God's will. They don't belong to God. These things are quite startling if you start to add them up. Now, this goes for anyone. When anyone rejects the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, as the God-man, they have a skewed perspective of God. You cannot connect with God spiritually unless you understand who Jesus Christ is and believe in Him. Because that is basic requirement number one. You want a relationship with God? You want to know God? It goes through His Son. Simply put, these people do not understand God or know God. Well, let's continue to verse 4 where Jesus gives another reason he is telling his disciples these things. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Now, many of these phrases that Jesus will use that we'll see in this next chapter or two anticipates his departure anticipates even further than that, him being glorified at the right hand, right hand of the Father. But we know within hours Jesus is going to go to the cross. He's going to resurrect three days after that. And then some 40 days he's going to send on to be in heaven with the Father. 
Now this is an interesting turnabout of things as we see the hour coming for those who are going to persecute. Jesus is telling his disciples these things, things we've just studied, because the opposition's hour is coming also. For a time, the opposition will be very successful at persecuting the disciples, the Christians. They'll break up church gatherings. They'll be able to murder Christians with impunity. And when this happens, Jesus says, and this is what he wants them to remember, when, these, when this hour comes for them, he's telling them that you may remember that I told you of them. Jesus makes a prediction in their life, and a couple of months later, it starts to happen. That makes one more confident. It builds one's faith, knowing that these things have proven to be true. Uh, you might just admit that it's easier to trust that way. When you see somebody uh, make a promise, and it sounds rather challenging for anyone to keep that promise, and then it happens again, and then again, and then again. And we've seen Jesus use this before. He talks about these things coming true in the future. This helps establish their faith. The other thing is, with these four warnings, these things will not take the disciples by surprise. The opposition is going to have their run, so to speak, where they pretty much get to do what they want to with Christians. They're in the huge majority often having the Roman uh, government backing, certainly the religious leaders backing, and the people's backing. Now, the idea here, again, is if they knew that these things were coming, and since Jesus said they were to come, then they come, they should also understand that God is sovereign, that he's in control. He allows them to come. He's in control of the situation. And this is all a testing of their faith. Now, I can't help but be reminded myself of the test that we go through now and how soon, when, and if we go through the tribulation, that is, you live that long, that much of what we've learned in that area in Daniel if you read through uh, Revelation, uh, Dr. Luganville's study on Revelation, you know that great persecutions are coming to believers. But at the same time, as you see so many other prophetic things uh, get fulfilled, then we can be confident and rest assured that God is perfectly in control and including you and the details of your life. So just as Jesus told them these trials were coming and they're going to get hit very hard with them, they can continue to spiritually fortify themselves and be ready and be strong when the persecution comes. You know, many of the small things in life that bother us and bug us, I'm one of those people who like to have everything going smoothly all the time. I, uh, work better that way. I'm not so distracted by some financial burden or health issue with one of the kids or even myself or the car breaking down. I, I, those things take up time and I view them as a nuisance, but I know that's part of life, of course. But <clears throat> some of them can be pretty challenging, like a personal health issue or a child's health in, in danger. But these things become tests for us to prepare for the big things later on. That one might seem to be the big thing at the time. But we certainly are going to go through a lot of problems, a lot of challenges, a lot of persecution if we stay on the track we are right now. They are coming. And if you stay faithful to Christ, you will be severely tested. The disciples are about to be severely tested. But they'll be less likely to stumble in their faith if they believe what Jesus is telling them now. <clears throat> Jesus goes on to say this in this verse. 
These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Well, when Jesus was with them, and he's still with them right now, but not for long. It's just a matter of hours now. He was the primary target of the opposition. He took most all the heat. Secondly, he was with them to give them support as they prepared for even their own uh, greater works and ministries. Once he leaves, they become the primary targets. And their support will come from the Spirit. So we're in that period of transition where we're moving from Jesus' presence physically with his own words and a person there to where he moves away and the Spirit will come in. Now let me remind you some of the things you have been taught for your application. Now, <clears throat> you say, well, you've heard this before. Yes, you have. And it's time we hear it again. Point one. You will be persecuted. <clears throat> Let me try this again. You will be persecuted if you grow spiritually. This is not just regular trials and tests of everyday life. This includes the persecution from the religious people, the different groups. Many of them call themselves Christian people, Christian leaders, Christian churches, Christian organizations and denominations. Why do I say so much about the Christians? Because you would think that they're the ones who would be on your side. Not at all. Once they flip over to the side of Satan and the world completely, they'll be some of your worst enemies. They will believe that you are the worst type of traitors to their false Christ. They will turn you in for what you believe, what you say, and what you do or do not do. They will test you. Now this is true today at a certain level. You will be tested by religious people. People who claim to be Christians. Their own view of what being a Christian is. I expect most of you have already experienced that in one way or the other. Whether it be just refusing to get into any kind of serious conversation with you or associate with you, with you like they used to. <clears throat> But we all face this if we follow Christ. I don't, I don't know of any Christian that hasn't. And it seems to be practically a promise of God that you're going to have to deal with people around you who are religious all the time who are going to mistreat you at one level or another. Second point. In light of what we have seen about the opposition to Christ and the coming persecution of the disciples who turn apostles, what are we to think about those who persecute us in whatever way? Many of them call themselves Christians, do they not? Do not many of them also reject the truth, show no desire to seriously learn scripture? You can bet that it's these people who claim to be Christians that aren't serious about the Word of God who will give you some of your worst problems. Why? Because they are so convinced they are right and what you're doing, studying the Word, isn't necessary. Three, we need to understand those who oppose us. It may be they are saved, but remain in perpetual immaturity because they have no desire to grow spiritually. So they stay with people like themselves. This is many churches today. Point four. 
remember this, no matter how strong the opposition is, the opposition is pagan or so-called Christians, you have the support of the God of the universe. You have your own personal advocate in residence, in you, to give you all the strength you need. Now, Jesus will say more on the Spirit in our passage in a short time. Verse 5. Jesus continues to speak to his disciples. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? These kind of verses kind of throw us for a loop when we see them. What does Jesus mean when he tells them this? None of you are asking me, where are you going? Now this may sound like a contradiction since this question has been asked by Peter back in 1336. Thomas seemed to apply it in 145. But the idea behind the question seems to be that disciples are more taken by surprise that it's going to happen. Uh, they don't seem to understand yet, and they don't. All the big things that are happening, not only now, but are going to be happening in the next few days. They haven't put them together in their minds. And when Jesus says certain things, there's certain things they just don't catch. In a short time, Jesus will depart to be with the Father, seated with him in the third heaven. He has told the disciples that, but they are having difficulty comprehending it all. He's going to go to the Father. He's going to send the Spirit. Then he's going to come back again in the presence of the Spirit. They're not going to be abandoned by Christ or the Father. Jesus has taught them how both he and the Father will come to indwell them. Now, these are some heavy spiritual matters that they're not getting or accepting and they're tremendously important and they can't take these big chunks of truth but they will grab them they will hold on to them and they will start to apply them within a couple of months they'll start to put these things together so, the point that Jesus is making from this verse is that uh, these things should not be taking you by surprise. You should understand where I'm going. You should understand what's next. And to encourage them to stay with him. Verse 6. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. You know, it's one thing to miss Jesus, that is, his physical presence, uh, and he's going to leave. But it's another thing to be so filled with sorrow that it becomes the controlling influence. So that they're not accepting the many things that he has taught surrounding his departure. This is a major advance in the plan of God. The cross, his resurrection, his ascension, the coming of the Spirit. Those things are all going to happen in the next couple of months. Now, of course, the cross and resurrection by the end of the week. Jesus is going to return to glory to the Father. And then here comes the multiple benefits that come from the sending of the Spirit, but not until he's gone to the Father, so that they will be doing greater things than, they, what, than what they saw Jesus do. Verse 7. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, 
Now, I usually translate that advocate, we'll put a little different this time, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus again repeats this teaching. This is what they need to remember. This is why his going away is to their advantage. Because then the Spirit can come. And his ministry, you know, just think about it for a moment. To get the benefit of being with Jesus, you had to be with Jesus. The Spirit is going to be not just with the believer, but in the believer. So that wherever the believer goes, whether it be on the other side of the world, or he just goes home, the Spirit is in him. The most Jesus could have been with, it was with them. But now, and we've just studied this, Jesus will also be with them in the Spirit. Listen to Jesus' words here. But I tell you the truth. When we hear Jesus say that, of course, we always expect him to say the truth, but when he says this this way, he's emphasizing the complete reliability of what he's about to say. He says, it's to your advantage. The present active indicative assume Pharaoh. It means to be advantageous, to be to your benefit, to be useful. It was to their advantage usefulness to their benefit that I go away that's what he says that I go away now that might have been almost incomprehensible for them to understand to suddenly lose their master teacher but Jesus is telling them now folks listen to me because I'm leading up to something well really big That I go away, for if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. You see, it's in the Father's plan that the Spirit doesn't come to indwell until Jesus is back at his right hand. He goes on to say, but if I go, I will send him to you. Now that Jesus has restated this again, and we have seen him teach the same thing over and over in these three or four chapters of Jewish method of repetition. Take it from a different angle, say it a different way. That's not a bad way to teach. Now that this is restated, Je Jesus will introduce some new points about the advocate. Areas of his work on earth. But before we do that, let me quickly go through some of those we've already studied in the last couple of chapters about the Spirit. One, he is another advocate besides Jesus. 14, 16. He will be with the believer forever. I think I should give you a quiz on these. I've been quizzing my son on driving. He's doing pretty good. You gotta take his driver's test pretty soon. But if I was to give, ask you to give me 10 things about the Spirit you've learned so far, could you list them? Three, believers know him because he is in the believer. Four, the Father sends him. Five, he will teach you all things. Six, he will bring to remembrance everything taught. 1426. Jesus will send him from the Father. 1526. He is the Spirit of Truth, 1526. He comes out from the Father, 1526. And he will testify about Jesus, 1526. Now let me make this separate point by itself because this has an application for us too. Let me use a timeline. Haven't used one of those lately. I guess I better keep at it to remember how to do this. Huh? All right, timeline. Let's get the cross up there. Let's have the 
well, let's just have the last three years of Jesus' ministry, all right? Where the disciples have been with him. These disciples, except for Judas, of course, will become apostles. The Holy Spirit comes. Acts 2. Living during the time of Jesus, these three years, would have been a fantastic time to see Jesus do what he does, to talk to him, to hear him teach. But it was not the best time for believers. Many people say, boy, I wish I'd have been there back during the time of Jesus. Oh, yes, that would have been interesting. But that's not the best time for believers. What Jesus has been teaching, if you've paid attention, the best time for believers, the time of advantage, starts right here. Once the Spirit comes and we enter the age of the Spirit. That's one way to put it. It's the New Covenant period, New Covenant church, where each of in Eden where each individual Christian has the Holy Spirit within him. You can't beat that. And not only that, we've also learned that the Father and the Son is present also. So you want to be with Jesus? You are with Jesus. You just have to continually remember that and acknowledge that uh, to make some application and remember that he is with you and in you. So when I pray for God to be with people. He's already with believers. The point is they need to realize that and let him act in their lives. Utilize the power he's given you. But the point I'm trying to get you to understand, far better to live in this age now. This is the age of advantage. And need I list some of the things the Spirit gives you? power, enablement to live the Christian life, gifts. He's with you, and we're going to study about this in the conviction ministries that he has towards the world. Not to mention, he's the one, he's the agent that activates your human spirit so that you become a believer. He's the one who renews you, rebirths you. Uh, it's through him that you, uh, that, let me put it this way, God uses the Spirit to make you born again. So the tremendous advantage that we have today with the Holy Spirit far outweighs walking with Jesus in his day. It's to our advantage. Now we learn from Paul the great advantages of the new covenant. Jesus has been teaching the disciples with these lessons on the spirit that they should be looking forward to that period. That Jesus does leave and he gets his rightful place with the Father in heaven and then forwards the Spirit on down to the believer. But this is when things really start to roll for the church, for God's people. Because this is when the apostles and the thousands of Christians there in Jerusalem really get spiritually activated. They get gifts. They start the church out running and within a few decades hundreds of thousands of people become Christians um, not much longer than that and you'll get into the millions that are becoming saved and build up the body of Christ folks this is the age to live and this is why it's so important, if you haven't caught on to this in my ministry anyway, the importance 
of understanding the ministry of the Spirit in your life. You can't even seriously study the Word without the Spirit. You can't apply the Word without the Spirit. You're liable to misapply. You can't do anything for God without being controlled by the Spirit. That's quite a statement. You can't do anything for God without being controlled by the Spirit. So how important is that? In verse 8, we come to three of the, or should say, like begin with like three or four verses that are often uh, considered complex. Some have a rather simplified interpretation that is wrong. But we're going to spend some time on these verses carefully, go through them. I must say it was quite an experience going through these verses and reading some of the different views and evaluations, and it is not simple to interpret. It is not simple to, uh, the Greek is not difficult, except on a couple of terms, but those terms, the passage turns on them. So we have to understand how they're being used. I have to take some of these frequent breaks in this study because I'm so congested this morning. We're about the coldest weather we've had in years here in Houston right now, in the Houston area. And uh, we'll have to deal with that too. But that's not a big deal as long as the heater works. In verse 8, we see three areas where he convicts people. All right? He convicts people. Now, I use the term people, meaning unbelievers but believers are involved but we have to understand that this is primarily written to unbelievers so let's keep in mind what we read here when we see the term world is basically the world of unbelievers now one of our key terms I said that this these passages turn on one of them is the word for conviction we'll talk about that in a moment 16.8, and he, that's referring back to the Spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Let's keep in mind that Jesus is looking to the future. All right? He's looking to the future when the Spirit comes. And when he comes, he will do these things. The reason I emphasize this is because in the Old Testament, it's not clear how much of this activity went on. But we're going to see how this works, starting at the coming of the Spirit. In about a month or so, I should say about two months, from the time Jesus says this. So this is going to happen in the future when the Spirit comes. He will convict the world. Let's talk about the word convict. I want to put up you a summary of some of the meanings. The word is englinko, englinko, e.g. makes the uh, ng sound. L, elinko, to bring up, to bring to light, expose. Second definition, to convict, convince someone that something is wrong. Third, to reprove or correct. And fourth, to penalize for wrongdoing. I think we can eliminate definition four because that's not really being used here. Two is the closest, but there's some overlap in two, definition one and two. I think the heart of it, though, is to convict or convince someone that something is wrong. So the second definition fits here. So let me summarize this verse 8 with some points. Sometimes it's better just to summarize with points than pick it apart. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So let's Understand clearly by going through five points. One, 
the conviction that someone is wrong on something starts when the Holy Spirit comes for the New Covenant era. So this conviction that we're going to start to see in these three areas comes when the New Covenant starts the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. 2. Here we see the Spirit acting as a prosecuting attorney. He shows the world they are guilty, that they are wrong. 3. He'll present evidence to the world that they are wrong in their thinking and actions. 4. It applies to three areas, sin, righteousness, and judgment. So I don't know what you've thought about the meanings of these phrases before, but if you have to redo your thinking on it, uh, let's do that because you're not going to understand this if you don't. Five. The next three verses takes one area at a time and gives the reason the world is convicted as wrong on that subject. So when we talk about sin, we're going to see why they're wrong about it. When I said it talk about righteousness, we're going to see why they're wrong about it. Okay? And then the third area regarding judgment and how they're wrong about judgment. Now that does put a different twist on the meanings of what these phrases mean. Uh, f uh, new meaning for a lot of people. Let's do the first one, verse 9. Now remember, the main idea is that the Holy Spirit is convicting the world about or concerning three areas. We're going to find out that he convicts them. Well, let me just chart this out. So the Holy Spirit will convict, show them wrong. All right. To the world in three areas sin, righteousness, and judgment. Okay? There's no E here. Here we go. Concerning sin or about sin. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Now the second key term that all these verses turn on, 9, 10, 11, is the term because. The Greek term is hote. H-O-T-I. Sometimes it's causal, and we'll translate it because. Sometimes it's explanatory. It'll just go on to explain um, what the passage means. I'm taking them as causal. That the second phrase once it tells you what we're talking about, we're given the reason why they're wrong about it. Okay? So, in verse 9, we see, Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Of course, Jesus is speaking. Two points on this. I'm just going to put the points up there with the... Uh, with the verse. Now just to let you know, I think I had this up to like nine points, then knocked it down to six, and decided that I'm going to try to really simplify this to get right to the heart of the matter. Hopefully this works. One, the world of unbelievers is continuous, continuously proven to be wrong or convicted because they refuse to believe in Christ. Now that's kind of what the verse says, isn't it? 
But here's the meaning. You have to get the meaning. You almost have to flip it around. If they did not believe in Christ, then they would not understand sin and its consequences and their need to believe. Now, this may be hard to grasp the first glance, but you can see why I might have spent some time on this trying to get it down to the points we want to understand. The reason people are wrong about sin is because, of, because they don't believe in Jesus. If they truly understood the consequences of sin, its effect, its doom, then they would believe in Jesus. I hope that helps. The world of unbelievers is continually shown wrong about what they believe about sin, concerning sin, and that's shown by the fact they don't believe in Jesus. Let me try a couple of other ways. The Spirit convicts or shows the unbeliever that he is wrong about sin because they do not believe. Now let me expand on this. The Holy Spirit works on the unbeliever's conscience, making it real to him that he does wrong things, that he's a sinner, that he's in a sinful condition, that he must repent. This is because he remains in a state of unbelief toward Christ. So the point the reason they are shown to be guilty of sin is because they continue to believe to refuse to believe in Christ. So let me get that up there for you. Here's the point of verse 9. The reason they are shown to be guilty of sin is because they continue to refuse to believe in Christ. Sometimes when you don't do something, it shows you why, why you're wrong about something. If you don't eat right, you get fat. You see? Maybe that's too close to home there. But if you don't do something, sometimes it shows you where you're wrong. Well, I don't need to take care of my car. I don't need to change oil. Really? Now you have engine problems. You see? The reason they are shown to be guilty of sin is because they continue to refuse to believe in Christ. Okay. Let's do the next one. Ten. Again. Main sentence, let's go back. Holy Spirit's convicting, showing them wrong. Now let's look at righteousness. Verse 10. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. The only way you can really understand this one is that you've understood been with me on this passage, or you know what the passage says. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you no longer see me. Now, what have we learned about him going to the Father? Well, it was to their advantage that he couldn't send the Spirit till he got there. So it has something to do with that. Here's our points. Now, this is, I had to keep five on this one. One, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of their guilt or their wrongness about righteousness. You can see I kind of simplified this. Two, this right righteousness is related to Christ going to the Father, which we have learned means the Spirit is going to be sent. Three, when Christ was on earth, he lived and taught true righteousness. And he showed the world, both through his life and teaching, what true righteousness was. 
4. But once Jesus is gone and the Spirit comes, it is the Spirit who works through the lives and words of believers. 5. The Spirit works through believers showing the world where they are wrong about righteousness. Five again, the Spirit works through believers showing the world where they are wrong about righteousness. So let me chart this one out too. Sometimes I do this for myself because if it doesn't make sense, I want to chart it out to see if that helps me make better sense of it. So you have the world. They see Jesus. He lived the epitome of righteousness. He spoke truth. He lived righteously. He uh, taught about what righteousness is. A good part of his ministry was pointing out to the religious crowd where they were wrong about righteousness. They were wrong about the law. They were wrong about what makes a person righteous. And for the years he taught, he showed them that, oh, what happened here? He showed them where they were wrong about these things. They truly didn't understand Jesus and what he was saying about righteousness. Now, our verse tells us that and concerning righteousness, well, I'm having a hard time with my thing today. Okay, I had to go back and redo this again. So when Jesus, let's get all this back right. When Jesus lived the righteous life and what he said and what he did, and what he taught, uh, the unbeliever observed that. All right? His conclusions were wrong. The Holy Spirit worked on him to show him that he was wrong. Part of his convicting ministry. Jesus taught, I mean, Jesus said here, because I go to the Father and you'll no longer see me. Now the, Jesus is gone. All right? He's gone. He went to the Father. Now, it's not Jesus people are seeing, but it's the believer. Once Jesus goes away, the believer, his life, now listen to me, your life, including your acts and your words, I could also, when I say acts, not only your life, but I also mean your works. Now the unbeliever looks at you and the Holy Spirit convicts him that he's wrong about righteousness. So when he observes you, when the unbeliever, when the world sees you and they see how you live and they misjudge you and they mistreat you, the Holy Spirit works on them to show them they are wrong. Now many don't respond. They don't respond at all. But that's the idea that the son had to go to be at the father. And now we see them wrong about believers on earth. This anticipates the spirit coming again. Remember, we're talking about the spirit. All right. The point, let me put it up here. The world is proven guilty about righteousness as they see righteousness through the life of believers who live by the Spirit. Now you see why your life bugs them. Now you see why the little things you do with the little things you don't do or the big things you do and don't do bothers the unbeliever. It convicts them. You don't use the bad language. You don't participate in some of their activities. 
You don't laugh at their filthy jokes. They know it's a filthy joke. And they know you don't laugh at it. You live the righteous life. The Spirit can begin to convict these people right there on the spot. So you are a constant testimony in your life also. And believe me, there are times you're going to do things that even lightweight believers don't understand. And they may side with the unbeliever on that one. Have you had that happen a few times? Well, there's something to look forward to. Verse 11. Let's look at the judgment. And concerning judgment. Let's just go ahead and get the points up there at the same time. We are running at the time. 1611. And concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. Now this is an even more tricky one you might say. The one before that was. This one even more so. Okay, point one. Those in a sinful condition in a state of unbelief needing to get right with God are convicted as wrong about judgment. That's the general idea. They're wrong about judgment, too. Two, the reason they are wrong about judgment is because Satan, the ruler of the world, the one they follow, was judged at the cross. That's one simple explanation. You're on the wrong side. Three, Satan's judgment is viewed as already happened. With the glorification of Jesus on track, by that I mean he's on the way to at this point we're studying and uh, in, in, in looking back into history. Uh, he's on his way to being glorified at the right hand of the Father. That's what I mean. With the glorification of Jesus on track and in progress to where he will soon, I uh, should have said, be glorified at the right hand of the Father, Satan's judgment is all but finally executed. Four. The unbeliever with Satan is headed for this judgment, for his judgment, to be executed if he does not repent of his sins and believe in Jesus Christ. Now, if you catch on to these points quickly, well, as they say, you're a better man than I because I had to go through this so many times to try to absorb exactly what this means so I can teach it. And that's, that's what you want to do as a teacher is know it so well that you can discuss it freely knowing what you're talking about. Point. The unbeliever is convicted of being wrong about his own judgment. You hear that? His own judgment. Because the ruler of the world, Satan, has been judged. Since this is the one they live for, then they too will suffer judgment. Now, I wouldn't be surprised that many of you who studied this passage, for the first time you have a better understanding of it than ever before. I say that because it happens with me too. I'm, I'm learning also. Now, we could also say that the unbeliever is on the wrong side. That's obvious. But they are on the wrong side, uh, meaning they're on the side of those judged rather than the side of the judge himself, Jesus Christ. So the unbeliever is convicted of being wrong about his own judgment. In fact, he's wrong about judgment in general. Because the ruler of this world, Satan, has been judged. And that's the one, that's the world in which they live. Satan is the ruler of this world. And they're wrong about judgment. And the Holy Spirit comes in and he convicts people. He shows them where they're wrong. Now listen to me, folks. One of the main ways he shows them where they're wrong, and this ties in the last two points together, is through the believer. Because living out your righteous life
speaking truth in love. The Spirit works through you to do that. The unbeliever. The Spirit, let's just put it like this. The Holy Spirit works on him and showing him where he's wrong about these things. Many an unbeliever believes that somehow they'll be judged. And they usually base that judgment upon their, their uh, life, whether they've done more good things or more bad things. Like God has a big scale up there of all the good and bad we've done, and that he will weigh it when it comes time. That's why many, they've even, you hear them even talk about that. You are one of the main ways that God, through the Spirit, convicts people from your life and what you say. Now you begin to see how God works through you. He works with you. And how you are such an important person in His plan. You are a operator for Him. Concerning sin, they don't believe in Jesus. They're wrong about Jesus. That shows where they're wrong about that. Concerning righteousness, Jesus goes to the Father. He sends the Spirit. That Spirit indwells you. And that you are used to convict the world through your life and your words. And then judgment they're wrong about their own judgment. Satan's going to be judged. They're on his side. The Spirit works through you on that. That's almost like, that's the, that's kind of the uh, other side of the coin. The good side of the gospel. Believe in Jesus Christ. You're saved. You go to heaven. The negative side. Do not believe in Jesus Christ. You die and go to hell. They're wrong about both sides of the coin. But we'll continue here next time. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. It's been another challenging one. Thank you for helping these things become clear in our minds through the ministry of the Spirit. And we ask now that we'll take these things, that we'll learn them well, uh, take them to heart, believe them, and then properly apply them. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.